Hi everyone and good afternoon. Thank you all for finding time and visiting today's webinar. My name is Dursal Hashimi and I'll be your moderator. I'm excited to be hosting this session. I'm a petroleum engineer and doing my master's degree at University of Essex. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Engineer Ahmed Ziftawi. Engineer Ahmed has 34 years of experience in the oil industry covering the Middle East in cold tubing and nitrogen service, wireline, well testing, completion, and downhole tools. Engineer Ahmed got his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Cairo University in 1983, has work experience in cold tubing, completion, wireline, and well intervention covering the following as an operator, supervisor, consultant, instructor, and a manager in more than 17 different countries. Wow, Engineer Ahmed, that's so inspiring and highly commendable indeed. And before I hand the mic to Engineer Ahmed, I have a few housekeeping items to cover about this webinar. First, today's webinar will be available after the live session on my Vitro YouTube channel as usual. Second, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have a question, please send it through the QI tab at the bottom. And by the way, I'd like to mention that Dr. Adjarhi also shared the timetables for upcoming webinars for August, September, and October on Arab Oil and Gas Academy Facebook page. It's worth to have a look on them. Now, welcome Engineer Ahmed, the mic is yours. Thanks, Russell, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. I hope you enjoy this session, which will be mainly calculation. Uh, in the first session, we talk about the uh, well control and barriers, the uh, well killing. We talk about the uh, hydrates. Uh, today, our session will be mainly calculation, how to calculate the pressure and the volume in a very simple way. We will not go into details uh, or into very complicated calculations. So today we'll go this will be our topics today, uh, hydrostatic pressure, bottom hole pressure, how to calculate the maximum surface pressure, how to calculate the volume, well, uh, volume, and the strokes and pumping time. So let's start with uh, what we call pressure. What's pressure? Uh, defining the pressure in a very simple way, it is the force exerted on a certain area. That's why it is, it's, the unit of the pressure is PSI. Pound, which is a force, per square inch, which is area. So this is the force I'm doing on my hand, pushing it down. This is a pressure I'm doing. So it is, as you said, as you agreed, it is defined as, <clears throat> force divided by area. This is about pressure. So what about hydrostatic pressure? How guys you define the hydrostatic pressure? I hope you have an answer before I start explaining what's hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic, by the way, hydrostatic, it is two words, by the way, hydro and static. So, uh, let us agree on this page before we continue that liquids are not compressible. You cannot compress a liquid, but you can compress a gas. Gases are compressible. And we both, both liquid and gas, we call them fluid. So the word fluid underneath, it goes either liquid or gas. And the last one, which is very important, that pressure the fluid is transmitted equally in all directions, as you see in the, the pressure exerted everywhere. How we calculate the hydrostatic pressure since we are using the uh, API system? We say that hydrostatic pressure equal TVD, which is the true vertical depth, times the density, times constant. 
in this formula, the hydrostatic pressure unit is PSI, where TVD are, is in foot, the density in PPG, pound per gallon, and we have this constant because actually if you multiply the feed by the PPG, this will not give you PSI. So we have this constant, so we have the end of this relation to have in PSI. And the meaning of the hydrostatic pressure, it is the hydrostatic, it is the pressure developed by a column of fluid at a given true vertical depth. Hydro means fluid, static means stationary, so it is a pressure created by vertical stationary column of fluid. You cannot calculate the hydrostatic pressure while in motion. It has to be static. So in this example, find the hydrostatic pressure of fresh water at 500 feet. If you look at this drawing, here we have a well that we drill, but we didn't drill it vertically. You see, it has an inclination. If we need to calculate the hydrostatic here at the bottom, we don't care how many feet of pipe we run. We care about this. TVD, the true vertical depth. So the measure depth might be 10,000 feet, but the true vertical depth is only 7,000. 7, so here to answer this question, we just multiply the TVD, which is 500, times the density of the water, which is 8.3 ppg, pound per gallon, times the constant. This will give you 216 psi, as simple as that. But the way we calculate this, we consider the full column of liquid is containing one, <clears throat> one fluid, which is in our case water. But what if it is water and oil? What if it is water, oil and gas? What if the well is shut in? How we calculate? To find the bottom out pressure of two fluid columns or more, simply add the hydrostatic pressure of the fluid column of the same unit of measurement together. So we add the hydrostatic created by the water, the hydrostatic head created by the oil, and if we have gas above, then the hydrostatic head of the gas above it, and if the oil is shut in, we have to add the shutting pressure at the end. Beside the hydrostatic head, we have pressure, I mean, we have what we call pressure gradient. What is the pressure gradient? It is the hydrostatic head pressure created by one single foot of liquid. That's why the unit of the, of the pressure gradient is PSI per foot. It's hydrostatic head per one single foot. And we have another formula of calculating the hydrostatic pressure. If we have a, through a, a pressure gradient, we say the hydrostatic pressure equal the TVD, which is true vertical depth, times LPG, which is the pressure gradient directly, if you have a pressure gradient. So in the above example, if we need to calculate the hydrostatic pressure of the water, then we multiply directly a true vertical depth by the pressure gradient of water, which is 0 0.433, 0 0.443. So, the uh, pressure gradient is the hydrostatic head created by a column, vertical column of fluid per one single feet. Let's have an example of a well containing two different fluids. Here we have this column, uh, or this pipe filled with water, and we have oil above it. And we have data about the oil, we have data about water. It tells you here the data that water density is 8.33. The oil density above it is 8.9 ppg. And we have the fluid level. The water fluid level is 7,890 7, MD, MD measure depth. And we said, 
when we talk about pressure, we talk about TVD. But when we talk about volume, we talk about MD, about measured depths. So since we are dealing with pressure now, so our eyes will see only LTVD. Our eyes will not see LMD at all. So in this example, since we are dealing with true vertical depths, so in water, vertical depth is 7,000. Here we have 7,000 feet. This is the water level depth. And in oil, we will go for 2,000. This is a TVD, 2,000 feet. Now we need to calculate the hydrostatic head pressure at 8,000 feet. 8,000 feet is somewhere here, right? So to calculate at 8,000 feet, we have to see what's on top of this point. You will see some water on top of it. Then we have the oil. So let's go to calculate it. Then we'll see that the hydrostatic head at this particular point, it is the hydrostatic head created by the water, the column of water, plus the hydrostatic head created by the column of oil. What is the TVD of water? Is it 7,000? Of course not. It is this portion between 7,000 and 8,000. So it is only 1,000 feet. What about the oil? The column of oil, it is between 7,000 and 2,000, which is 5,000 feet. So to calculate the hydrostatic head at 8,000 feet, it is the hydrostatic head created by the water, which is 1,000 feet, times the density of water, times constant, plus a TVD of oil, which is 5,000, we agreed on, times the density of oil, which is 8.9, times 0.052. This will give us the hydrostatic head at the exact point we need to calculate hydrostatic at, which is at 8,000. So people, you might ask, what about Ahmed, this portion above the oil? Since I didn't give you any information, you cannot calculate it. But this will be very important if we shut in the well. If we shut in the well, so you have to, to add a hydrostatic head of this column of gas plus the shut-in pressure, which is measured by a pressure gauge on top here. Whatever it is, 500, 1,000, 2,000, you have to add this to the hydrostatic head pressure. Now, let us see how we calculate the bottom hole pressure and the surface pressure. So we have data from a well. The data is telling us that the well depth is 9,150 MD, 7,900 TVD. Since we talk about pressure, remember, our eyes will not see the MD. Our eyes will see only the TVD, which is 7,900. Formation pressure gradient, it is 0.57 PSI per foot. This is the pressure gradient. It is PSI per foot. And we have the gas pressure gradient with 0.08 PSI per foot. This is a gas. What we need initially, please, Ahmed, calculate the bottom hole pressure. Actually, if this is just a pipe, and you need to calculate the bottom hole pressure. And bottom hole pressure is the hydrostatic head pressure created by the gas, by this column of vertical gas. But, have, but now we have a newcomer. You see this green arrow? This represents the formation pressure. The pressure comes from the formation entering the well. So now, 
if I give you guys a pressure gauge in your hand and I ask you to take this pressure gauge and go down all the way to the bottom, stay at 7,900 feet. And please look at your gauge, see how much pressure it reads, and give me a call. When you go down, reach 7,900 feet, and now you have the pressure gauge in your hand. This pressure gauge in your hand, he will read which pressure? He will read the hydrostatic pressure created by this column of gas, or it will read the formation pressure that comes from the well, or it will read the sum of both, or it will read the subtract of both. Again, you have a pressure gauge in your hand. I ask you to take it and go down to the well. I know it is three and a half inch pipe, you cannot go through, but uh, let us imagine, like I'm imagining now you are listening to me. I mean, it is as simple as that, yeah. <laughs> so you go down. When you reach 7,900 feet TVD, please look at your gauge and give me the reading of the gauge. My question now is, if this pressure gauge in your hand, it will read the hydrostatic pressure created by this column of gas above it, or it will read the formation pressure that comes from the formation, or it will read both, or it will read the subtract, this minus that. If you are not confident of your answer, I say, let us make it simple. Let's go to your, uh, let's go to the yard and ask the welder to make us a manifold. A manifold, you know a manifold, right? We make a manifold. Ah, oh, you can see it now. This manifold, let us have here four nozzles. We put a gate, we put a, a valve in each nozzle here. And then let us have four compressors. This compressor will give you 150 PSI. This will give you 50 PSI. And this will give you 200. And this will give you 300 PSI. OK? Of course, this manifold is closed. And please, at, at the top here, put me a, an apple and put me here a pressure gauge. What we are going to do now, we are going to open these valves and we are going to let these compressor works. My question is, the pressure gauge here will read how many PSI? Is it gonna read 150 or 50 or 200 or 300 or the sum of all? or the subtract of all. Uh, in one of my sessions, one gentleman said, okay, Ahmed, just a minute, 150, then 200, 400, 700. It would need 700 PSI. I said, uh, <laughs> if the pressure gauge at the top reads 700 PSI, then me and you, tomorrow morning, will be multi-billionaire not millionaire, multi-billionaires. Because we invent something in the engineering, uh, it breaks everything in the past. I am sure you understand that when you open these valves, this compressor will feed the manifold with 300 PSI, right? So you will have here 300 PSI. None of these compressor will work because this 150 cannot win against 300. 
this 50 cannot enter inside 300. So the pressure gauge will read the highest. If you open the pressure gauge, you will not see calculator inside. The pressure gauge cannot subtract or add. <laughs> he goes to the higher pressure and reads it. The pressure gauge will read the highest pressure in the circuit. So if we take this and go back to our example, and I repeat my question, the pressure gauge in your hand, I know you have been there for 10 minutes down the hall. This pressure gauge will read the hydrostatic hit or the formation pressure or the subtract or, or both. It will read the higher. If the will is dead, the pressure gauge in your hand, which is represent the bottom hole pressure, will be the hydrostatic hit. If the will is dead. If the will is alive, definitely the pressure gauge in your hand will read the formation pressure because the formation pressure will be the higher because the will is life is producing. In this case, in our case, you will find out that the hydrostatic pressure of the gas is much, much less than the formation pressure. So the pressure gauge in your hand, it will read the formation pressure. What I'm saying is not 100% correct, of course. Why? Let's have, let's go back to our well. This is our well. And now, this is the formation. The well is perforated here. What I just said, I said that the bottom wall pressure, which is here, equal the formation pressure, which is here. If what I said is correct, this well is dead. This well is to produce oil. This pressure has to be less than that. This is what we call drawdown. The drawdown is the difference in pressure between two points. What brings the oil all the way from here, all the way to enter your well? It is the drawdown. Because if I ask you, since you are already there, would you please go into this line and measure me this point, this point, this point, this point? We know that the, this pressure here is less than here. This pressure is less than here. So pressure goes from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. That makes that what makes the oil moves, because there is a drawdown. The drawdown has to be positive, otherwise there is no movement. But in our example, since we are doing, we are talking about simple principles. So when we talk about the bottom wall pressure, we assume that we are talking the nearest point to the formation. Nearest point to the formation. When we talk to the formation pressure, we talk about the nearest point to the well. So we consider them as a one point. But you have to know that there should be a drawdown. So in our case, let's go back to our case. We need to calculate the bottom wall pressure. It is the formation pressure. Do we have the formation pressure? Of course, we have the TGD. And we have the pressure gradient of the formation. So just multiply the TGD by the formation pressure gradient. So it is 4,503 psi. This is the bottom hole pressure represented by the formation pressure. The second requirement here, how to calculate the maximum surface pressure. And forget about engineering. Forget about the college you are studying in. Let's go, let's talk to our brains. Now we have a pressure here at the bottom. 
This pressure is 4,503 at the bottom. And this pressure would like to go all the way up to the surface. Simple basics. If there is nothing above it to restrict it, it will go all the way up with the same value, 4,503 psi. But actually, this 4,503 psi at the bottom, if it moves upward, it will find something above it. There is a restriction above it, represented by what? Represented by the hydrostatic column of this fluid which is in our case, gas. So by the time this 4,503 goes all the way to the top, we have to reduce this hydrostatic head from this value. So the, the maximum surface pressure is actually the bottom wall pressure minus the hydrostatic head created by this column above it which is gas, in our case. Do we have the hydrostatic head of this gas? Of course we have it, because, because we have the data. We have the TVD, and we have the pressure gauge, the pressure gradient of this gas, which is 0.08. So to calculate the hydrostatic pressure of the gas, we simply multiply LTVD by the pressure gradient of the gas. This will give us 632 psi. To get the maximum pressure, surface pressure, we have to deduct this value from the bottom wall pressure. So the maximum surface pressure will be 3,871. The nice part of the engineering, which is in calculations, is the numbers. The numbers tells you if you are going on the right track or not. So actually, if you calculate the maximum surface pressure and it become greater, you found it greater than the bottom wall pressure, you are wrong. Because in any life well, the maximum value of pressure represented by the formation pressure. Otherwise, the well is dead. But in any flowing, in any flowing well, the bottom wall pressure is the maximum pressure expected. Number three, the, the third requirement. The working pressure of the wellhead equipment. Okay, Ahmed, for this well, if we need to buy a wellhead equipment, should we buy it uh, 2,000 PSI, 3,000 PSI, or 5,000 PSI? Based on the data, we know now that the maximum expected surface pressure is 3,871. So definitely, your wellhead equipment should be higher than that figure. Then definitely, we'll go to 5,000. In one of my sessions, one guy didn't like what I said. He said, come on, no, Ahmed, just a minute. Let us multiply 3,871 by 1.5 as per the API. So this will give us 5,801. So our will hit should be rated for 5,801. I said, fine, that's great. Let's go. Let's go to the supermarket and let us buy, let us purchase this Christmas tree you are telling me 5,801. Do you believe, guys, that you will find it in the market? Of course not. This is a custom made. Then you have to go to the factory and to custom made this uh, Christmas tree and wait six months, and the price of that Christmas tree will be higher than the 10,000 PSI Christmas tree by 20 times, maybe. <laughs> so we'll go to the nearest, which is 5,000. The fourth requirement of this example, find the minimum kettle fluid density. 
Now he needs to kill this one. So what is the dynasty he should use for the Akel Flair? I need to go back a little bit to show you something. I'll go to this one. And as you see it, we agreed that hydrostatic head pressure equal TVD times density times constant. And we also agreed that hydrostatic head pressure equal TVD times the pressure gradient. Let us go to these two equations. On the left-hand side, HP, it goes all the way down HP. Let's go to the right-hand side. TVD, it runs all the way down, TVD. Here we have density times constant. When it goes back, it became PG. So from one and two, you will find out that in pressure, Gradient equal density times constant. Am I right? This is what the pressure gradient is. It is the density times constant back pressure gradient is the density times constant this is what the pressure gradient is if we try to use this to solve our problem to find the density that kills this well we have the formula pressure gradient equal density times constant Density is the unknown, and the pressure gradient is for the well we need to kill. One equation and one unknown. So simply, the density is the pressure gradient divided by the constant. It will be 10.95 ppg. Take this figure, 10.5, 10.95. And let's go to the original formula of the hydrostatic pressure, which is TVD times the density times constant. TVD is 7,900. At density, you just calculate it, 10.95 times constant, 0.05 times 0.52. If you multiply this by this by this, the end result will be 4,503, which is exactly the bottom wall pressure. Which means that if the hydrostatic head equal the beach, the bottom wall pressure, the well is dead, right? There is no movement. When people from my previous vision session said, Ahmed, but we said that when we do the hydrostatic head, you said, Ahmed, that we overpressure by 200 to 300 psi. Yes, that's right. But look at the question. Find the minimum, the minimum fluid density. The minimum is what makes balance. What makes the balance is the minimum. So it is 0.95. In these calculations, Definitely, we neglect so many factors that exist and affect these figures we are calculating. Like what? Can you answer, please? Don't let me answer everything. I repeat my question. In these calculations, we neglect Factors that affect the final calculations. Why what? Friction, for example. We neglected friction. We neglected thermal expansion. 
all these factors will affect. But in well intervention, as I said, I, I always say, it is not going, it is a, not a calculation session. It is not uh, a completion uh, session, but it is to give you a general idea. That's why in here, in this example, we neglect these other factors. Let's go to calculate the volume now. I'll go directly to an example. Remember, we are using LAPI units. So when we talk about volume, the volume is barrels. The capacity is barrel per foot. So the data we have, we have casing capacity as barrel per foot. We have tubing displacement capacity as barrel per foot. We have tubing capacity as barrel per foot. We have pump displacement, which is barrel per strokes. This is the pump. The pump, this is the piston of the pump, and piston and cylinder. So this information is telling me that each time the piston of the pump moves from A to Z to the end, it displaces this amount of fluid. And we have the tubing shoe. We have the depth, measure depth and TVD. I'll repeat what I said while ago that when we deal with pressure, we deal with TVD. When we deal with volume, we deal with MD, measured depth, not TVD. Before we go to the requirement of this example, I have a little question for you guys. What is the difference between a tubing displacement capacity which is the second information, and the third one, which is the tubing capacity. What is the difference between tubing displacement capacity and a tubing capacity? I need an answer. I, I cannot hear you. Let's assume that this is our well. This is the well we drilled, okay? This is the well we drilled. And after we drill this well, we run the casing. After we run the casing, cement it. Let us fill it with water. Let us fill this well with water. And let's assume we fill it with 500, feet, uh, 500 barrels of water. Now we are going to run the completion, the production tubing. When we run the production tubing now inside the well, what happens? What happens actually? My laptop, there is water falling down to my laptop. Water is coming out. Let us assume that after I run the production tubing all the way in, 50 barrels of water comes out of the well. What is this 50 barrels of water? It represents what? This is the tubing displacement volume. This is the volume of water displaced by the metal thickness the metal of the tubing. This is what is the 50 barrel. So the 50 barrel, this is what we mean by tubing displacement capacity or tubing displacement volume. But what is the tubing capacity or tubing volume? How many barrels I can fill this production tubing, this tube? How many barrels I can fill it with? This is the difference between the tubing displacement capacity and the tubing capacity. 
the tubing capacity, and the tubing volume, it is how many barrels I can fill this tubing with. But your tubing displacement capacity or volume, it is the amount of liquid or fluid displaced by the metal thickness of the tubing. Back to our example, I have these, this well filled with 500 barrels of water. Then I run the production tubing. 50 barrel is out. My question to you is, what is the total volume of this well? Initially, it was, it was filled with 500 barrel. I run the production tubing in. 50 barrel is out. What is the total volume of the well now? Don't tell me 500, don't tell me 550, because 500, this is history. This is recorded in the, in the, in the, in the, in the book of the well, yes. But you will not see it again unless, unless you remove the tubing. But as long as there is tubing inside, the total, the maximum volume of the well is 450 which is the original 500 was filled with minus the tubing displacement volume. So please, let us write this down. How to calculate the total volume. It is the casing volume, which was 500, minus tubing displacement volume. Am I correct? Casing volume minus a tubing displacement volume. It is the 500, originally 500, minus or after I run the production tubing inside, I can tell you that the total volume of the well of the well is a sum of two things. It is how many barrels I can fill the annulus plus how many barrels I can fill the tubing. So I can say, number two, it is tubing volume plus an annular volume. So it is either the case in volume, which is the 500 originally, minus the tubing displacement volume that came out, or it is the sum of both, annular volume plus how many barrels I can fill the tube with, tubing volume. There is actually a third case allowing us to calculate the total volume of the well, which is a very special case. Let's go to, back to our example, where we have our well filled with 500 barrels of water. And let us have this data. Case in volume, 500 barrels. A tubing displacement volume, 50 barrels, which is came out while running the production tube. I will give you one more information that the tubing volume is 150 barrels. Again, the data we have, case in volume, 500, tubing displacement volume, 50, a tubing volume, 150. This is the data we have, okay? Let's go back. Now I have this well filled with 500 barrel of water. And I'm ready to run the production tubing inside the well. But this time, when I ran the production tubing, it was closed in. 
closed end means what? I have a plug at the bottom of the tubing. Let us run in the hole now. My question to you guys, after I run this closed end tubing all the way in, how many barrels of water comes out of this well? This is the data we have. Case volume, 500 barrel. Tubing displacement volume, 50 barrel. Tubing volume, 150 barrel. I run this tubing now closed in. After I run it in, how many barrels of water comes out? The answer is 200 barrel. Why? What comes out is the sum of two things, actually. The tubing displacement which volume, which is represented by the thickness of this meter, plus the tubing volume itself, because now I, in the previous case, I was, I was running it open hole. So while running in the hole, the tubing was filled. I was filling the tubing. But now I'm not filling the tubing because I have a plug here. So what comes out is the sum of two things, tubing displacement volume plus the tubing volume. So it is 50 plus 150. So what comes out is 200 barrel. Now I have a tricky question. We have 500 barrels. This was filled with 500 barrels. I'm running the tubing closed end. When I run the tubing all the way down, 200 barrels came out. My tricky question is, what is the total volume of the well? Please, count from 1 to 20 before you answer. 500 inside, full. This is closed in. I run it. 200 barrels is out. What is the total volume of the well? Now, I will also count from 1 to 20 before I answer. 20. Some of you guys will say 300, I know. Why they said 300? Ahmed, this is a very simple question. A kid can answer it. This was filled with 500. You ran in the hole, 200 is out. The remaining is 300. Simple as that. You are wrong. The remaining volume is 300, yes. But this 300 does not represent the total volume of the well. The 300 remaining represent the annular volume only, which is here. But I can take 150 barrels from there and pour it inside the tubing because the tubing is empty. I can fill it. It is the same tin and the same jug. The total volume of the well is still 450. In this particular example, when you run the tubing closed, Total volume is case in volume minus, which is the 500, minus tubing displacement volume, when you run it. But we have to add this, which is in our case 200, went out, huh? But you have to add tubing volume, which is 150. So it will be 500 minus 200 that went out. You have to add the tubing volume, which is 150 barrel that you can fill the tubing with. So it is two, but this number three, it is a special case. You don't use it unless it is clearly mentioned that the tubing is run closed in.
right? In case closed end. I hope you agree with me. That's it. Now let's go for the calculation of volume, which is another example. Here we have also the tubing depth, measure depth, and TVD. We have the tubing capacity, barrel per foot. We have the annular. Oh, sorry guys, we didn't finish our, didn't finish our previous example. Now we have the, the difference. We know the difference between tubing displacement capacity and the tubing capacity. Let us see the requirement of the question, sorry. How many strokes to displace tubing string? We need to know. How many strokes we have to do? How many strokes with this piston? We have to go do like that till we are able to displace the tubing string. Tubing volume. Do we have the tubing volume? Of course we have. We have the tubing capacity, which is barrel per foot. We multiply it by measure depth or TVD measure depths, we multiply it by measure depths. So the tubing volume is 107 barrel. How many strokes we need to apply to get rid of this 107 barrel? If every stroke is removing this amount, 0 0.0899 barrel, divide by, divide the volume by the pump, this place. So we need to make 1,191 stroke to get rid of this 107 bar. The second requirement is copy of the first one. How many strokes to displace the entire wheel board? Entire wheel board needs a total volume. How we calculate the total volume of the wheel? We said we have three ways to go. It is either casing volume minus tubing displacement volume, or it is the tubing volume plus the annular volume, or we have the third case, which is the special case in case of closed end. It is the casing volume minus tubing displacement volume closed end plus tubing volume. So here, with the data we have, are we going to go for which one of the three ways to calculate? Actually, they never mention here closed end, so we will not use the third one. The second one talk about tubing volume plus annual volume. We don't have annual volume here. But the first one saying it is the casing volume minus tubing displacement volume, which you have, you have the data. Casing volume minus tubing displacement volume. This will give you a total volume of the well. Divided by a pump displacement, this will give you the number of strokes in one simple line. It is casing volume minus tubing displacement volume. And this amount, this number of barrels, divided by a pump strokes, pump displacement. This will give you the number of strokes. Another example, we have data, we have tubing depths, again measure depths and TBD to see which one you will use. And now we know that we, in volume, we use measure depths. We have the tubing capacity, barrel per foot, and we have the annular capacity, barrel per foot. So now we need to calculate the total volume and go to the second way, which is tubing volume plus annular volume. And we have the pump rate, which is not barrel per stroke, but it is BBM, barrel, <clears throat> barrel <clears throat> per minute. Each minute, this pump displays this amount of barrel. 
The first requirement can be the time to pump the buttons up. What does this mean? If we don't understand the question, we'll never be able to answer it. What do you mean by pump the buttons up? Let's have this little drawing here. This little drawing here shows this. This is the casing, and this is the production tubing. And here we have the packer. We have here the SSD sliding side door. And let's assume that both annulus and tubing are filled. And let's have this bowl, red bowl at the bottom, and the SSD. And we start circulating. After how many barrels, this bowl, which is at bottom, will be at the surface here. This is what we mean by bottoms up. Something at the bottom will go up. So this bowl will reach, the, which is at the bottom, will reach the surface. After how many barrels? Is it after pumping the tubing volume or after pumping the annular volume or after pumping both tubing and annular? You might ask me a question. It depends, Ahmed. Are you pumping forward circulation or reverse circulation? Actually, if you go back to the question, calculate the time to pump the bottoms up. He never mentioned, is it forward or reverse? If he didn't mention, that means using the normal method. I don't, guys, have to tell you that if we have a course that lasts for three, four days, at the end of each day, I don't have to tell you Guys, remember tomorrow morning, you come with your clothes on, right? Because this is the standard. Unless we have a party, then I tell you at the end of the class, okay, guys, remember, tomorrow you come naked. This is not the standard, right? This is not the normal. So in any book you read about in, in drilling or in completion or COVID, normal, Circulation is the forward circulation. So, since he didn't mention, then it means that the normal circulation applies, which is the forward circulation. So actually, this bowl, this red bowl, you see it here. If you start pumping, to see this bowl at the surface, you have to replace what is in. You have to push what's in front of it. What is in front of it actually is the annular volume. So pump the bottoms up as an expression, or pump up the well, both means annular volume. Remember, pump bottoms up, or pump up the well. That means an annular volume. Unless I try to play smart with you and I change the question here. Tell you, calculate the time to pump the bottoms up and then between practice, I tell you reverse circulation. If it is reverse circulation, pump the bottoms up means tubing volume. So now, how to calculate the time to pump up, to pump the bottoms up? Annular volume. Do I have the annual volume? Yes, I have the annual capacity. I multiply it by the measure depth. It gives me the barrels. Divided by rate. I need 68 minutes. Second requirement. Calculate the time for complete circulation. Complete circulation means what? Tubing plus the annular. 
this is what complete circulation or total circulation. So it is tubing volume plus the annual volume. You need 95 minutes. Last example we'll have, we have a table. This table shows us the casing sizes, different casing sizes, different PPF pound per foot, as you see. And these four columns, the remaining four columns, represent the volume. The questions say, Find the annual volume above the packer in barrel of the phone well. And he's telling me table represents the annual volume. This table is directly represents the annual volume. You don't have to calculate it by what the, the standards we have in, in this oil field books. We have table representing uh, production tubing data and we have table represent the casing data and to calculate the annual volume you have to use the formulas which have square roots and by here i am giving it directly i'm giving you that here we have our tubing is three and a half inch 9.9 power barrel per foot the casing is 958 47 pound per foot and we have the packer depth TVD and measure depth. Of course, since we are dealing with volume, we will use the measure depth. The casing data we have, which is 958, 47 pound per foot. So the first column, as you see, it is all about 958, but which <clears throat> barrel per foot? It is 47. So we'll go this column. This, this is our casing, which is 47 pound per foot. And now these four columns represent the annual volume. But since we are using an API, and he needs it also in barrels, so if we go here, this is cubic feet per linear feet, linear feet per cubic feet, this is not our case, barrel per foot, linear foot, yes. This is our column, barrel per foot. This is our column, so we have to go till it intersect this column. So this is the annular volume per one single foot, 0 0.0577. We multiply it by a measure depth to get the annular volume above the pack, as simple as that. Uh, I am done with the calculations of today. Uh, and this was our second session. Our coming session will start talking about the completion. We, have, we will have two sessions about the completion. But as, as far as today's session, it is, we are done. So Rosé, Thank you, sir. I'm ready for yeah. the question. Uh, thank you, sir. And what an informative session with the clear illustrations, actually. Uh, we have a few questions, and uh, let's begin with Sarah. Sarah asks, oil density is less than water density, while oil density is 8.9 ppg. No, this is, this is an example. It, it, it actually, uh, this is a wrong example. I should, it has to be, you are right, it has to be less. But this is figures, I'm just putting figures. But you are right, even for the example, I should put it less than 8.33. You are absolutely right, it's a mistake. Okay, other question, how can we understand the service pack pressure? The service? Pack pressure. I, I don't understand, what, what, does, what does she mean by service? back pressure unless she needs a shot in pressure because when when we when oil is producing and we explained this in our first session 
the moment you shut in the well, you change the case from flowing condition to static condition. So what we will have in the well after a certain period of time, that water will be down, above it we will have oil, which is less density, then we will have a gas. But this will not happen in a moment. It takes time for these gases, which is 1,000 feet below, to travel all the way up. Maybe it takes half an hour. And we'll have some gases sitting at 3,000 feet. It will take more time. And we have gas at 10,000 feet. It will take more time. So as long as gas is segregating uh, from the liquid and goes to the surface, creating this cap, the surface pressure or the shut-in pressure start to increase. Uh, we say that initially, if we shut in the well and the well suddenly moves to 1,000 psi, this sudden increase of pressure is created by the formation buildup. Then it will go from 1,000 to 1,050, 1,060, 1,090. This slow increase in pressure over a long period, this is caused by the gas segregation, the gas migration all the way to the top, creating this shut in pressure, which is exerting as a back pressure to the formation. I hope that this is what she means by the back pressure. Okay. Uh, Omar asks, is there a material that discusses all the aspects of well intervention, like a textbook, for example? Y yes, we do. Uh, we do have a, a, a complete book, which is the actual well intervention book, which I can send it to Dr. Ahmed al garhi who can uh, distribute it to whoever needs it. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Engineer Ahmed. And uh, I'd like to encourage everyone to share today's webinar in, in social ne network, in Facebook. And that's all for today. Thank you all. Bye-bye.